This Talking Flutes podcast is kindly sponsored by Trevor James Flutes, making life sound beautiful. You can show them some flute love by following them on Instagram at TJ Flutes, Trevor James Flutes on Facebook and at trevorjamesflutes.com. Hello and welcome to Talking Flutes with John Paul Wright and me, Claire Southworth. Hello, John Paul. Hello there. Hello there. Welcome, everybody. And we've got some more questions, which we're going to dive straight into. Yeah, you don't, you don't be chatting today, do you? Um, well, we can chat a bit later. I mean, the sooner you get through this, the sooner you can have another cup of coffee. <laughs> oh, great. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> so this is a question from William Doughty, and he asks... Can you tell me why old French flutes are expensive? So I'll start this off, John Paul, but it's yeah. not my area of expertise. It's, it's probably more, more yours. But I would say it's, it's, it's the same for any antiquities. Um, but the expense doesn't always equate to a better instrument. If the flute's been totally refurbished, then the, there will have been a great deal of expense involved in that. So... That have been tuning, padding, replacement of keys, springs, and, and etc. But I suppose there are still are bargains to be found. But don't be surprised if you have to pay still quite a lot to make these instruments playable, because a lot of them don't even make a sound. What you should be looking for on the flutes is something special, unique, or original in the sound, if it, it will play. My my experience of old French flutes dates from years ago, I, I remember picking up um, an old Bonville flute, which needed a lot of work, but I could make a couple, I could get a couple of notes out of it, and there was just something so different in that sound, it was sort of magical, and just holding it felt sort of magical, so I bought it for, for not very much money, I had it completely retuned, and the thing is, when you do have work on these old flutes, it's not necessarily going to result in a better flute. It'd be a working flute, but you might actually lose that original sound that you fell in love with to start with. But I did have it retuned and, and repadded and replated, and it was, it was wonderful. So it was, it was worth the effort. So I made money on it because, of course, I bought it for one set amount, paid another amount, and, but eventually sold it for a bit more than that. The same, I had a librette flute, same thing, that I had worked on on it, and I, I knew when I picked it up originally, it sounded fantastic, wasn't too expensive, and then same when I, I bought my Louis Lott flute. It had a, a beautiful sound to it. I had worked on, on it to make it playable, but it's, when I eventually sold it, I was able to sell it for a lot more money because it was done. Someone's buying a, a finished product, where you've, it's a bit like buying a, a, a refurbished house, you know, if someone's gone to the effort of replacing windows, doors, floors, putting a new kitchen in, you're going to pay a lot more for it. It's the same sort of thing. What do you think? I think there's something magical about an old French flute, and you've mentioned three there, Bonneville, Le Bret and Louis Lot. And it's the same in saxophone world, because you have the old Selmers, and you have the cons and the kings, each of which give you a different feel, a different sound, and a different sensation when you play. But most importantly, because each one is serial numbered, not every instrument, say every, every Selma, for example, Mark VI, is good. Just like not every Louis Lot is good. We have the ability now that if you can go and see a Rudel cart, or that's not French, it's English, but you go and see, you go and find a Louis Lot, it's catalogued. So you can find the date of that. And a good Louis Lot player, or a good Louis Lot repairer, or a good expert on Louis Lots will know when the, the, key, the key moment of that make, the making happened. Because it wasn't made by Mr. Louis Lot, there was different makers, as, as we know. And there is, but there is something magical about a Louis Lot that has been. I've only played Louis Lots that have been retuned by I think Nick Crab. Um, he tuned my flutes. Oh, yeah. did he? Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely beautiful. But there's something 
beautiful about them. I don't know. It's obviously to do with the construction, the, the metals used, because I've never played a solid silver Louis Lot. It was something else. Well, they're, they're all impure, the metals, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And that's what gives them the uniqueness, unique sound. It is, and it's to do with, you know, the, the cut of the, the head joint isn't like a cut of a head joint you will find now, where the sound is, wah, it's in your face. Mm. There is something, you have to go and find your sound. Mm. And there is something really quite beautiful about that. But also a holding history. Being able to play on a flute that is well over 100 years old, something quite magical. And there was a time not that long ago where I think wasn't nearly every principal player in London playing on a... An old French flute. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, your your Louis Lot, that head joint was oh, it sang. That head, there was something magical about that head joint. But yet, I've also played on Louis Lots that have been dead. Yep, and so have I. There's no resonance to it. Yep. But you're exactly right. And the reason why flutes are really expensive, I think we've covered this in the past, is that it's to do with the expertise in making it, and it's to do with the materials, and. Modern day flutes are made very differently to old French flutes of over 100 years ago. Would an old Louis lot stand up with the rigours of the study that students have to do now compared to many years ago? I very much doubt it. But also the sound requirements. You as a professor, a uh, flute professor, you would have seen different, you would have seen playing develop in the years that you were, you were teaching. People coming through, and it's certainly uh, having listened to it over the years we've gone from this sort of delicate playing to this sound that is really really big the flute players in front of you, you go to a flute convention anywhere in the world you hear flute players from a mile away well not not literally but there's this big sound yeah and there aren't the subtleties are there no and for me i've never heard a loud louis lot but i've heard a beautiful louis lot mm. so why are louis lots really expensive i think they're really expensive like you said if they've been retuned, replated, repadded, and they're from that era that you know you've got a corker. But other than that, you could be in danger of paying a lot of money for a flute that won't necessarily bring you joy. No, unless it has an individual quality, it's not going to be sort of of use to you. No. And it's, you'd probably, rather than go searching out for, a, for an old flute, which might not work very well, far better to look at the, the flutes that are around us today and experiment with different head joints, mm. different bodies, so that you find something that is unique for you. Yeah, absolutely. And you had an old, I'm trying to think of the, because I had one as well, uh, the, the, the old flute that you had, we had a Louis Lot. I had an Almeida. I, Almeida, I had an Almeida as well. Mm. What a, and that was quite old. I mean, what a... What a beautifully made instrument. Oh, incredible. He was an inc incredible craftsman. Yeah. He made the most wonderful, wonderful flutes. Yeah. And I had an Armade, the Armada flute with a Louis Lot head joint. Magical. That is a combination, isn't it? Yeah. I have an old Lafan, really old, 35-year-old mm -hmm. Lafan made by, by uh, the good man himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, there's just something magical about something that was old. Does it give me what modern day flutes give me actually gives me more because i believe i've grown up with this my my grandma bought it me <laughs> pete's pete's uh, panting again that's the dog by the way if you didn't listen last week claire has two dogs in her kitchen they've both been for a walk and pete has now decided to pant again it's so a very he, hot day it is a very he's hot been day. running for three hours yeah. or two hours <laughs> But if I was buying a flute now, why would I buy an old French flute? The answer is no. And that's quite sad, really. It's just, but there's so many beautifully made flutes out there. But yeah, we'll go back. We'll have, we, we, won't, we don't disagree on this because you've always said you have to buy the flute that you fall in love with because you spend longer with the flute than you do with your partner. So if it's an old French flute and you find it, buy it. And you can afford it, buy it. If it's a, a flute from a, another maker, then that's the one that you fall in love with. Yeah. So they're expensive for a reason, but just because you spend a lot doesn't mean it will be a good one. Or it, it won't make you any better, will it? No. <laughs> so, uh, next question from Martina Lahou. And she asks, when I take a big breath in before playing a first note, I find myself taking too much air in and can't control my playing. What should I be doing? Oh, over breathing. Oh, getting that gets that point where you actually yes, I've got you now. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So she takes a big breath and then she can't control her playing. 
Yeah? yeah, fair point. Well, the answer's in the question, by which I mean taking a big breath. So you don't have to take a big breath. You don't have to completely fill up before you play. And maybe you have to think about rhythmical breathing, because rhythmical breathing helps establish a rhythmical controlled breathing. So if you're thinking about whatever piece you're playing, or let's say just pick a, pick a melody and take a breath, take different types of breaths before you start. So, for example, you could take a, a breath over four beats or then over three beats, over two beats, over one beat, mm -hmm. and see what effect it has on what you're playing afterwards. Because it could be that you're just trying to fill up completely and then you've lost control. And it could be that you're maybe holding on to that breath, which makes you lose control. So it's a bit like if you have a, um, a hose pipe in the garden, you know, a water pipe. Mm -hmm. If you turn the tap on and put your hand over the end of the pipe, the pressure builds up. When you take your hand away, the water spurts out at a much greater pressure than if you just turn the tap on. Now, we're like that. If you think of your air supply, the same thing. If you take a big breath in and hold it, you've lost control because you need to get rid of the carbon dioxide. So that's why I said the, you need to think about rhythmical breathing so that you breathe in and then you're, you're basically breathing out again. There's a very slight hesitation, but if, you're, if you've got a, a very gentle, short phrase, I'm not gonna, if, if I've got that, I'm not going to take a huge breath and hold it before I start playing. I will take the air that's needed for that phrase. You could also try singing the phrase, because often we, we sing in a much more natural way than we play. And the same thing, you don't fill up completely to sing something. It's, it's a far more natural thing. So I think you need to experiment with the amount of breath you take in and think about the rhythm or the speed of which you take that breath in and do it over different number of beats according to what's... And in the rhythm of, of the beat or pulse of the piece that you're playing... Are you a nose breather? Would you breathe in through your nose rather than through your mm, mouth? I don't actually. I breathe in through my mouth. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, whatever suits you, then do. And then that breath will hopefully reflect the music that, that follows. So if you take a huge breath in and hold it, you'll just sound panicked afterwards because you can't control it. So the breath... I'm talking now about emotional breathing, yeah, so the sure. breath reflects yeah. what it is that, that you're, you're playing. So you, you think about, we, we've talked before about how you would breathe if you were excited or angry or frightened or tired. And you use that according to the piece you're playing. So you've got something that's very gentle and calming. You don't take a quick breath in. You take a nice, slow, measured breath in in order before you breathe out. Do you know, I'm just practising that as you say that because that seems r really um, an obvious thing to do. So say if you're playing La Primidi and you yeah. know you have a long phrase, instead of breathing in in one big gulp, just breathe in in a measured way, whether it would mm. be two bars or three bars, but just do it gradually so that when you then release it, you're... Are you saying breathe in and to, to that point where you're at release mode and then release? So it's one yeah, rather than... Absolutely. And in that piece in particular, the last thing you want is the conductor to be bringing you in because the breath is so much more important. The control there is so important. So most conductors sort of just put their hand, lay their hand down as if to say, whenever you're ready, because it's just the yeah. flute starting on their own. Yeah. So that, that way, all your practice where you've taken a nice, slow, measured breath in and then start. Then so is it one movement rather it's than... It's really one movement, yes. So that, do you know, I think I might have found out what's always might been my problem because yeah, I've, been, I'm, I've always been used to taking a breath and there's always been this sort of pause, but... I get it, is that the more that it can be one movement, the smoother, and also the easier it will be to take that note, that starting note, whether it be a t or a pa or a ha, mm. that easier that will come out because it will be much smoother. You're not trying to, as you yeah. say, the hose pipe effect. Mm. Yeah, so and if we talk about, we were talking uh, earlier on about nerves, mm -hmm. and nerves also can be, tr can be controlled much better by your breathing. Yeah. So if you 
control your breathing when you're nervous in terms of slowing it down and being more mindful of that breath. So when you get to the playing, you're doing the same thing, being a little bit more mindful and let that breath reflect what it is you want to play. Don't just think you have to fill up completely for everything you play. So like a wave goes in and then yeah. out. Yeah. Oh, uh, wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah, I've got that one. I've learned something today. <laughs> Good. <laughs> now, the Go next question. Oh, this is... This will be this will be interesting to, to hear hear what we think about this. Somebody's asked, "What do you find attractive when you listen to a flute player live or in a recording?" I've put in brackets or unattractive. Okay. So, what you. do you find attractive? I said or unattractive because I can probably think of more things that are unattractive than attractive. <laughs> um, it's much easier to, to to put it that way around. But if I'm talking about things that I find attractive in in what I hear. Most important thing for me is that emotional communication. Somebody who speaks to me. Someone, when they play, makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Um, and so, sometimes it can just be one note, but something that really speaks to me. And then beautiful sounds and a subtle variety of, that, of those sounds, of colours, of dynamic someone who's really thought about the style that's required for the genre of music that they're playing rather than playing in the same way. So if I go to the things I don't like before letting you tell us what, about what you like, my biggest bugbear is I hate players who move, who move too much, where it's so distracting. I mean, you see a lot... If you just go onto YouTube and look at flute players... The excessive movement, it's not necessary. And it's so distracting for when you're trying to listen. So that's the that's, well, first thing. The, the other is constant loud playing. You mentioned a little bit earlier about... It seems to me that, uh, you know, we were talking about old French flutes, is that uh, there's a certain style that comes with old French flutes that you don't get with modern flutes. They, they, can, they play so easily that modern-day players just tend to play loud and raucous and there's no subtleties, and there's no softness, there's no feeling. So constant loud playing, only one tone colour really gets on my nerves. Lack of playing melodic lines, lack of musical intelligence. That, I mean, by that I mean the lack of knowing about styles and genres and just playing everything the same. So that's my starter. How about you, John Paul? Well, I'm just listening. Is it the, uh, the refuge man going past? No, it's the building works opposite. They're Are they still take, going? They're taking two years to build a six-storey block of flats at the cricket ground. Uh, and then it'll be new stands at the cricket ground. Uh, so I'm, I have noise most days now, unfortunately. Ah, so what do I find attractive? I find attractive, like you, the ability to commute the, if the musician is, or flute player is communicating to me. Now... I never. I find unattractive flute playing, fast playing. I can be wowed by fast playing, but I don't find it attractive. And for me, I mean, I haven't really. I don't really get turned on by listening to flute players, unless they're playing slow music, because slow music, you, there's nowhere to hide, and slow music or slow, a uh, slow movement or something that is purely tonally based will show an understanding from the musician of the music they're playing when I first heard Wizan Bustani play and I, I can't remember what I heard him play first but my word there was some beauty in that he wasn't just playing a note we spoke about it before he wasn't playing a note there was this there was more to it there was a communication that he wanted to give to the audience and yeah Pete's just had a drink so what I find attractive is a musician that's gone the extra mile and thought, what am I playing? What sort of, what do I need to communicate to the audience? And me understanding that that's what they're trying to tell me. And again, excessive movement. I normally find excessive movement. I stop listening to the flute player. I start watching what they're doing. If they're moving to the left, right, they're bowing, whatever. My focus is then not on their playing. So I think they, they are, to a degree, doing themselves a disservice. What don't I like? As I said, I don't like fast flute playing. I, I love it in an orchestra because there's a pattern to it 
and there's a structure to it. And I know if you're playing a concerto, the last movement and the first movement normally has quick music. But I can be wowed by that. But I can't, I don't find that attractive. Mm. No, you can be, certainly be impressed by fast playing, but it's the slow melodies that really show someone's ability. Yeah, and I think there's beauty in... And you know when we play slow, and you know when people play slow, there's a tonality that you can get, or that you know if you hear a flute player. I remember when I first heard uh, Jimmy Galway playing uh, London Derriere, and, uh, or Danny Boy, was it? probably know, best better known as the beauty in that even though this guy is a genius at playing fast the beauty of how he plays that and the story that you can you can feel within that and okay he's irish can a non-irish person play danny boy as well as an irish person well if it's within your blood if it's within your psyche there's a story i mean can a can hungarian pastoral fantasy Doppler. Doppler. Can a Hungarian player play that better or differently to someone from England? The answer is yes, because it's in your blood. Better, again, we, we, we're talking about semantics here. For me, it is always the communication. And I will find a singer, I will find a singer singing beautiful aria would, that would get to me, because it gets me at a different level. A flute player can only get to me at a different level if they can do something with the tonality of their notes. It's not just one-dimensional. Am I picky? I think it's probably been around flutes all these years that has made me quite picky. I can appreciate good flute players, but I don't necessarily fall in love with a flute playing sound. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, I, I absolutely agree. I, I, don't, I don't listen to so many flute players because I find myself being too critical. <laughs> um, and there are, there are just a few that I find mesmerising. And um, I agree with, with you about Wiesam because I was at college with Wiesam and he could just play just a phrase and there'd be something there that wasn't with anybody else. You know, he, he, he's always played from the heart and there's, a, there's so much expression and feeling and musicality and depth, it's soul music, and it's really, really does speak to me. So, if you've never heard Wissam Bustani, please go and listen. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, the guy's a genius. And, and just to conclude on that, is one of the very first concerts I went to, my granddad took me to a concert in London at the Royal Festival Hall, and there was a Russian pianist, and I was mesmerised. The guy, for me, was a genius. I can, I can still remember it. Uh, and it was his hands flying everywhere, sort of quite sort of straight, but wasn't moving around. Hands flying absolutely everywhere. And when my, gra my grandfather took me home, and I went back to see him the following weekend, and he read me a review, I think it was only nine or ten. I said, what a wonderful, wonderful concert that was. And he said, well, interestingly, I think you need to read the review that was in the London Evening Standard. Hmm. And it just said how the guy was technically flawless, but artistically bereft. Oh, because harsh. yeah, it was apparently it was really ro it was too robotic for that mm. critic. Yeah, young guy sat there. I was just completely mesmerised amount of sounds, everything he did. But always remember that sort of artistically bereft. Mm. It's interesting because just remind me of something that you know we, I often see on social media platforms some whiz kid you know who's sort of seven, eight, nine, ten <coughs> years old. And I was going, absolutely amazing, incredible. And they're playing something that is always fast. Yeah. Always, always fast. And yes, wonderful dexterity and, and uh, uh, ability, but absolutely no music whatsoever. So, and that really disturbs me. It disturbs me that people are just so impressed by fast finger playing and not by musicality is it just so we're getting older and grumpy no no i've always been the same <laughs> i've always been the same i've always <laughs> gone for music over fast fingers yeah i never have i was i was always whizzed i was always my mind was blown away by 
people playing fast, fast. Jimmy Galway's showpieces and Magic Flute and the albums he did where he was just playing. Oh, they were fantastic, and they were my. I would always listen to those. Yeah, you know, he was the he was the showman, the man yeah. with the golden flute. Yeah, but I I had a recording from before he was very well known of him playing Bach sonatas, and it's the most stunning playing. Mm. I was absolutely mesmerised by his playing of Bach and his slow playing. But he also had this incredible ability and still does to play very fast, very well. <laughs> G- uh, Jimmy, Sir James is a one-off, but you're exactly right. If you can't be taken to a different, a different world in your mind when you listen to that man, then he might as well give up and go and become a road sweeper. As I was once told to do. Oh, dear. <laughs> Give up the flute, become a road sweeper. <laughs> well, that, uh, I think, brings us to the end of this podcast, John Paul. We've answered a few questions. Thank oh, you very much. That's gone fast. Yeah. So uh, thank you for your, your input. And um, we still have a few more questions to ask on, answer on the next, for the next time. Great. But for now, that's your lot for today. And hope to talk to you again soon. Great. Look forward to speaking to you all again soon. And thanks again for inviting me down, Claire. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye. Talking Flutes and Talking Flutes Extra are podcast productions by the Trevor James Flute Company. For more information, visit trevorjamesflutes.com.